From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. And they call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Folks, if you're listening now, congratulations. You have survived what corporate America calls Q1 of 2024 (laughs) uh q being short for quarter not q anon but you know we don't get in the c-suite we don't know what all their acronyms mean and if you're listening to this right now hopefully you have survived the eclipse eclipse eclipse, eclipse, or it's happening right now and you're watching it Mm -hmm. as you roll this audio yeah right on i actually sent a note to uh to our crew earlier today where i asked uh wherein i asked uh whether we could move our recording time on monday such that we could witness the eclipse here in the fair metropolis of atlanta georgia uh it starts at uh 145 it goes about to 4.30 local time here in Atlanta. Yeah, and NASA's launching three rockets at the moon's shadow, which is Coincidence? Fine. Totally fine. And CERN yeah, is fine. CERN is just kicking back up now because they had problems earlier mm-hmm. and they had to wait till now to kick back up. It's fine. Should we be concerned? Check out that episode Uh, while you're looking at that. uh, We've got to talk about some very big things. There's a hawk in the sky. There's a problem with three bodies, but maybe it's two. Uh, There's a little bit of anthropodermic uh, bibliophagy uh, would be the (laughs) word. And... uh, and maybe maybe we start here with a. Uh, oh, did you like that one, Matt? I did because I only know it because I've heard you say it before, and I just imagine how many people are like, "No idea what the hell he just said," but books. that's fine. <laughs> skin, yeah, books that have some skin in the game, quite literally. Uh, before we get to all of that, we have an important. Uh, important piece of news. Uh, Codename Doc, could we get some like breaking news kind of sound? Perfect. God, you're amazing at this. All right. So uh, for a while back, we have been talking about something called on the streets, Havana syndrome. Uh, Do we want to give a quick and dirty description of what Havana syndrome is? I think so. Uh, Not unlike Gulf War syndrome. I mean, it's not not people who were on the front lines of a conflict per se, but I believe it was some diplomats that were stricken with this potentially due to an unknown source, whether it be a weapon of some kind or there are lots of other theories that went into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, astute, uh, perfect and succinct. We uh, <laughs> we talked about this. I think we did a actual episode on this. The idea was that not just ambassadors or consular officers, but their families were being targeted by some sort of thing that, to your point, Noel, just like Gulf War Syndrome, left them with debilitating medical conditions that they could not quite explain, nor indeed uh, could these conditions be properly diagnosed by medical professionals. Yeah, we, we've covered it in several episodes over the years, and then in uh, September 22, we did an episode with Jack O'Brien yes. where we did the, the thing we're talking about where it was kind of, I don't know. Jack O'Brien. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Jack O'Brien, notable fan of Corvids. Congratulations, Jack. And I wish you well on your journey. Uh, Jack is also a um, the, the creator of Crack.com and the creator of Daily Zeitgeist, friend of the show, uh, responsible for uh, so many amazing conversations. Jack and I and this show, we went back and forth on the nature of Havana Syndrome, and we left it with the idea, remind me here, Matt, uh, we left it here with the idea that perhaps it was psychosomatic. Well, that was Jack's conclusion on the show. Uh, I don't know. Mm, mm, mm. Jack, I hope you I hope you taste this. I texted him earlier as soon as the news came out. So, uh, 
60 Minutes recently uh, recently aired something that is the result of a collaboration, a joint investigation from 60 Minutes Der Spiegel over in Germany and The Insider. This joint investigation by journalists, by civvies, found that the things being called AHIs or anomalous health incidents may actually not be psychosomatic. They may indeed be evidence of uh, a Russian-made weapon. So let's start there. Uh, before, before you, mean, we... you mean like the way we've been thinking it might have been for oh, a long come time? On. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. We got to be nice to Jack. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that's nothing against Jack. Jack was using some of the best uh, sources out there that mm-hmm. you know had come to these conclusions. It's just that's what it felt like when the story first dropped, right? That first report that we read. My God, I know how many years ago that was, but like it felt like this was it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and also we we also um, can't say enough good stuff about that conversation. Please listen back because we listened back to that conversation. And I think we were applying the same critical interrogation that we apply to any sort of, any sort of conspiracy of this caliber. The idea is that there is a deployment of a particular technology. Think of it like a a laser composed of sound, right? And this can, as a result, uh, it can go through glass. It can go through certain materials, right? Uh, And it will not generate physiological effects. It will generate uh, it will generate extreme discomfort, but that may not be lasting. We saw earlier. Uh, We talked about it in a strange news program quite briefly. Uh, We saw earlier that studies have shown there are no long-term neurological deformations, right, Uh, of of exposure to this stuff. However, I don't know, man. I can't wait to talk talk with everybody about this. The, The journalism here seems pretty apparent. They correlate the attacks to presence of Russian officials, you know, kind of like your friendly CIA folks who work for IT at an embassy. Uh, I just want to check with you guys. Do you think Havana syndrome is real or do you think it is created perhaps by a Russian technology? Well, the effects reported by people who have gone through this, you know, who were at least self-reporting victims of these attacks do they report physiological interactions? Just to, it's not the kind that you can see, right? right? It's like a patient coming into a doctor's office and saying, "I've got these really massive headaches. There's a terrible ringing in my ears. It's like my ears hurt. This sound, whatever it is, is so um, intense, and I'm also feeling dizzy. I can't concentrate. Again, like almost long COVID effects that were being reported in a in a weird way, but having some kind of uh, audible source that uh, these people at least self-report to be causing it. Um, I I don't know. Ever since it started coming out, the idea that everybody could mass hallucinate or just jump on the bandwagon of this is why I feel dizzy, this is why my, my head hurts, this is why my ears, you know, I've got tinnitus or whatever, um, that just didn't seem right to me. It seemed like, it felt like something was entering those people's living spaces we just could not describe what it was because we didn't know that thing. Like what is the actual variable? Yeah. What is the, what is the actual method to make this occur? But remember in our episodes, we found things like those uh, weapons that could do something like this. Yes. The precedent Sonic weapon kind Mm -hmm. of things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're right on the money. It's not outside of the realm of possibility, right? And science fiction, again, as we always say is only fiction, for a certain window of time. And it looks like, I I don't know, again, listening back to our earlier conversations, I thought we were very fair. And, um, you know, we, uh, (laughs) weirdly enough, on Twitter or um, what do they call it? Y, X now? There you go. X. Z. 
one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they call it now, uh, Jack O'Brien and I were having, I think, a, a pretty in-depth collegiate exploration of the possible causes. And one of the things that we're often saying is, you know, look at the precedent of quote unquote, non-lethal acoustic weapons, right? The so-called pain ray. We talked about that, right? Was it the issue with that though, that like, you know, with the tests or the things that we discussed in the episode, it would be, you'd have to be like in the next room, right? <laughs> that we couldn't really yeah. shoot them long range. Well, uh... That was our assumption. Noel's right. That was our assumption in that conversation. We may have been incorrect. Mm. Well, because then we learned, look, man, we we learned about the sphere in Las Vegas and how they can beam (laughs) audio, directed audio into a single person seated in that giant place. They can beam audio that's in Japanese to one seat and next to it, they can beam the same audio, but it's in English. No wires. Yeah. It's just directed. Guys, audio. doesn't that seem like the kind of thing that sounds like really cool and buzzy for tech reporting, but that could down the line have some consequences? <laughs> just what? Seems a no little... way. Yeah. Man, everybody went to see you two last night is experiencing Havana syndrome. That's weird. Uh, oh, yeah. No, but I guess it feels so possible to me that. The way it's being dismissed, and it has been dismissed in some of the other reporting, some of the you know official mm-hmm. statements that have come out of various governments, it just felt like it was shoveling it under under the rug for diplomatic reasons. But what is there a new report or something? Is there new information? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Matt. There is indeed. <laughs> so uh, as we were saying, Insider, Der Spiegel, uh, in 60 Minutes, they spent more than a year or about a year investigating this, talking as off books as they could. Uh, and they have uncovered, have, let's give you the full story. Insider, March 31st, 2024, Roman Dobrokotov, uh, Christo Grozev, and Michael Weiss, or Weiss, uh, they, uh, they published this collaboratively, and they have the following. New evidence links the GRU's Unit 29155 to mysterious attacks on U.S. officials and their families. What, what is GRU? Yeah. GRU is uh, GRU is the nasty boys of Russia. Uh, GRU is like, um, I guess the best way to say it, it's their foreign military intelligence. So it's kind of like uh, militarized CIA. Okay. Okay. They're the type to try some sort of Rube Goldberg-esque way to kill Castro. You know how the CIA came up with all those acme level Bugs Bunny ways to kill Castro or oh, discredit yeah. Castro, right? Oh, I got it the way you put it first time. The nasty boys. Yeah, they poison <laughs> cigars. Yeah, big fans of polonium. Gru. Let's put it that way. Uh, so what they found, like two nine one five five, is kind of a a sabotage squad. They're they're sort of black ops maybe wearing ties and they're what, what we found in these investigations reading about these investigations is that one Russia does have these weapons that are on the edge of sci-fi. They do have weapons that could maybe do these things. We also found that uh, numerous Western folks were read onto these programs believe that this non-lethal acoustic weaponry has traversed the chasm between science fiction to science fact. And what they're finding is they they don't like necessarily the term non-lethal acoustic weapons. They like the umbrella term directed energy weapons, which to our earlier point is what we have been talking about And indeed, I think we were softly predicting it for a number of years. Again, to be clear, folks, playing along at home, the term Havana syndrome is intensely unfair. Uh, The government of Cuba is not inventing these things nor deploying them. It's kind of like how in the early 1900s, that epidemic of influenza was called the Spanish flu. Because the 
first government to report it was Spain. They didn't invent it. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Unfair. But, but, but here's what they find. They find that this technology, again, it is a real thing. It is not science fiction. It is possible to build and deploy these ideas as weapons. And they found some really nasty stuff. And looking back through it, like looking through the GRU's track record, looking through 29155, what we see is, um, what we see is a really good case that Havana syndrome may not be an instance of mass hysteria. It may not be a bunch of stressed people suddenly getting migraines. It also jibes in a troubling way with uh, some of the work of, um, who was that guy we called the Alex Jones of Russia? Foundations of Geopolitics guy? He kind of built their strategy of hybrid warfare. Oh, Alexander Dugan, I think. Foundation yeah. of Geopolitics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The hybrid warfare idea is that um, if you are outmatched in terms of conventional warfare, then you will you will kind of nibble at the edges, right? Of 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 the snack. <laughs> you will you will not hit maybe POTUS, but you will maybe hit someone adjunct or adjacent to POTUS. You may not hit the ambassador, but you may hit their family, right? Yeah, or you may get revenge on someone who was working counterintelligence against, you know, some other operation, right? Or someone who was successful in infiltrating some kind of signals that you were putting out at some point, right? I remember seeing in the report that it may have something to do with not necessarily revenge, but like getting people on their radar and then going, oh, well, guess what? We're not going to let you do that again. We're going to debilitate you with these, you know, weapons that no one will ever see. And, oh, what was the other, what was the other big thing? With the, in that report, Ben, they were matching up individual members of this unit, right? Yes. In places and times, like going, oh, this agent from 29155 was here at the time that this person was either attacked or experienced Havana syndrome. Again, correlation. Yeah. And we have to, like, part of the hybrid strategy uh, for the theorist in the crowd would be would be akin to gaslighting, right? Oh, yeah. you just have a headache. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also you don't have actual evidence. Oh, you have a list of our agents that were in those places at those times? What does that mean? Does What does that mean? It means nothing. You know, with that point, I think we, we've got to pause uh, in a moment for a uh, word from our sponsors, and perhaps this is an episode in the future. I thought we could end with a quote from Greg Ed Green, Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army, who says the following to 60 Minutes, quote, If I'm wrong about Russia being behind anomalous health incidents, or again, AHI, I will come onto your show and I will eat my tie. It appears there's oh, it appears there's something there that is not entirely psychogenic. It's something the Russians don't want you to know. Anyway, ads. <laughs> <laughs> And we've returned with another piece of strange news. This one, uh, I don't know. We've, I think we've talked about this um, particular tome uh, of 19th century literature in the collection uh, over there at Harvard University. A little bit of light reading called, uh, I'm not a French speaker, do my best, uh, Des Destinées de la Main by Arsenier Pousset. Hopefully that was somewhat passable. That's pretty good. I didn't completely yeah. embarrass myself. Uh, yeah, a 19th century French novel. This particular edition, however, happens to be bound in human flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, whether or not we've talked about this one in particular, we know <laughs> you you said it at the top and it got Matt all at Twitter. Um, there is a, uh, I guess, a school of book binding. That involves that very thing, you know, binding pages. We did mention pages. this in a previous episode. This is one of the very few confirmed books of this nature. 
That's right. But it is a, a field of study. And whether or not there are, you know, uh, a plethora of examples, it is something thought to have been done more frequently, you know, in, in the past. Um, and, yeah, again, this book is uh, has been has been in the collection at Harvard. But no more. Uh, they have, in fact, decided after a, a study uh, on the subject came out to remove this particular uh, edition of the book Bound in Human Skin. Um, the Houghton Library, actually, by the way, is the name of the uh, of the facility there at this institution of learning uh, where this book has uh, remained for more than 100 years, uh, often as a highlight of a tour. If you go check it out, you're going to get shown the book Bound in Human Flesh. Um, the study that I mentioned, uh, or the report rather, I guess suppose you could call it, uh, came out 10 years ago. Scientists at Harvard confirmed, um, and, and just, just to say really quickly, I believe it was always conjectured that this was in fact bound with human skin, but it wasn't until relatively recently, about 10 years ago, that scientists at Harm, Harvard did in fact uh, verify uh, that this 19th century French book was in fact bound in human flesh. And uh, the Washington Post describes the contents of the book as uh, a tale of the destiny of the human soul or a study of the destiny of the human soul. The binding, not the book, the pages contained therein, uh, have been removed due to what the uh, university refers to as the ethically fraught nature of the Mm. book's origins and subsequent history. Um, The flesh in question was taken from the back of a uh, psychiatric patient in a French hospital who passed away due to a stroke in the 1800s. um, this was a uh, a woman. Now the uh, officials of the university say this portion of the volume has been taken uh, and placed into what they refer to as respectful temporary storage until they decide how to dispose of it in a dignified manner. Um, Now, Ben and Matt and I had a little conversation off mic just about the kind of nature of consent uh, in these types of cases. You know, we've certainly talked about things like the bodies exhibits, where we know that a lot of the, um, I guess, specimens on display in in those uh, were non-consensually taken uh, from formerly living um, prisoners yeah, you know, that's uh, what, from China. That, that's the word I'm using there uh, when we're talking off air, non-consensually, quote-unquote, donated. Uh, the, the person who has never been identified officially, uh, this woman did not, did not give consent uh, for her body to be used in this way. Now, there are a lot of people listening, to be fair, who are thinking perhaps I'd love to donate my body to science and I'd love to myself become a book. And that's all well and good if that's what you want to do. But check out our earlier episodes on donating your body to right. science. You don't get to choose. It's <laughs> yeah. just like paying taxes. You don't get to choose where that stuff goes, but the money is you. Guys, That's right. Guys, I'm kind of joking here, but I'm also a little serious. What if you got a tattoo on a part of your body that was roughly book sized mm-hmm. that states that you <laughs> wish to have this part of your body, <laughs> your skin used mm-hmm. in the binding of a book? And it's like you all have to get out, it notarized. Yeah. And You'd signed. have to have a yeah, the <laughs> seal tight. would have it's to be branded the, on yeah. there. That's yeah, fine. no. This is why I'm a notary. I think that that would be a way to do it. It'd be a way to get it to do it properly. I, I mean, you're joking, but I do think if it's a document and you yeah. signed it and it's official, then yeah. I guess you know, who's I don't know who's going to do it though. Just just to make it official, I'll do it. But just to okay, make it great. official, get another get another page size thing on your skin that says this page intentionally left blank. That way, people <laughs> know it's official. That's a cool idea for a tattoo, period, Ben, I have to say. Um, you could just put that, literally just that text on your entire back. This page <laughs> left intentionally blank. Oh, jeez. Uh, New so tramp th- stamp, love it. Uh, right, dude, I really like that. You, we Not at all. You, no, this is, this, we're, this is a, a rail that goes in many directions because, as we're saying, this is a, a conversation about 
ethics. We also know that a lot of university collections and dare we say, or we just say museums were built off the backs of those that fell to colonialism and oftentimes artifacts that were wholesale stolen and and, and not given back or, or, or the, the theft even acknowledged, you know, for many, many, many years. Um, and I mentioned a study uh, 2022, uh, Harvard put out a report on human remains in university museum collections. Uh, and this is from the uh, the steering committee, report of the steering committee on human remains in university museum collections. And as you can imagine, Harvard is a, is a pretty big deal, you know, being such an old institution and one that continues to be, you know, so highly regarded and has generated some of the... They're real up at covers. Great yeah. minds. They're going places, right? So it is kind of up to them. Uh, and, I, you know, I do applaud this, this, this paper. Um, to kind of set the tone, right? They refer to the use of enslaved or likely to have been enslaved individuals um, and, and then what to do in those situations. There's a section on ethical care. Uh, there's a whole section on, you know, how to train, um, you know, curators and, and educators on this kind of stuff. Uh, a section on recommendations for memorialization, um, consulting the communities, you know, who, who are affected by uh, these remains, you know, being in in these collections. And, the, you know, the first page uh, with, has a big pull quote from Lawrence Bacow, the president of Harvard, saying, we must begin to confront the reality of a past in which academic curiosity and opportunity overwhelmed humanity. And we certainly see that in academia uh, way back, from way, way back. I mean, things like the Tuskegee experiments. You know, I mean, obviously there are extreme examples. There are more examples of curiosity and just maybe things that didn't age well. And then there are outright examples of dehumanization and treating people as test subjects first and humans second, if at all. And that is, is a big part of this debate. Uh, and the paper is what kind of caused this action to remove it. Um, and just a little bit of background on this document, uh, or the, the, the novel rather, um, he, who say the writer gifted the printed text of the book to a friend of his, a guy by the name of Ludovic Bouland, a doctor who then by choice, uh, and I guess we've talked about the idea of resurrection men, you know, all of that. That was, that was kind of the order of the day. He bound the book in human skin that he had acquired while studying uh, as a medical student and penned a handwritten note um, that is inserted into the volume describing his reasoning uh, as such. Uh, a book about the human soul deserved to have a human covering. By looking carefully, you easily distinguish the pores of the skin. He should have put his own skin in the game, though. No joke, dude. I mean, it's a Hannibal lecter kind of sounding, so, or rather Buffalo Bill, I guess, you know. Um, it's real gnarly, guys. Uh, the note uh, goes on to say that he didn't have anything stamped on the cover to preserve its elegance. I guess when we think of making things out of human skin, we often think of, like, horrific atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, where we know they made, you You're know. You're talking about lampshades. Lampshades, wallets, what have you. And then, of course, things like that that were perpetrated by folks like um, Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killers. And the way he's talking about this, this, this guy who did this, it doesn't really smack of academia. It smacks a little more of weird fetishism to me. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, uh, the idea of the human a book about the human soul deserved to have a human covering. And, and to your point, Matt, who is this woman? And, and, and who, who asked her if this was okay for her to be made into a book for, like, rich people to trade around, especially when she probably died in poverty and, you know, uh, pain and, and mental anguish? It just seems wrong. It gets into a weird discussion if you, if you pull it all the way out, and it makes me think about these policies that many cities have that prevent churches and other organizations and even individuals from doing things like providing food for unhoused individuals, right? Or you mean when they won't allow it. What, what I is mean is just... the way, yeah, they won't allow it. The way that society still views the uh, the least of us. Sure. Um, and the way, well, I mean, really, that's. Well, even the least of us who can't get into an Ivy League school, <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, there's an othering inherent to that uh, whole designation in and of itself. Well, yeah, and, and I guess what I mean is it, that 
quote that you had before about the time when science, the, what was it, the desire to explore science? The curiosity sort of outpaced or at the very least outweighed the, you know, what's right. I, I don't know that we've ever fully escaped that. I think we have many institutions that have and individuals that have, but uh, I think overall there's something unfortunately human about this entire thing. Exploring because we can. And going to those lengths because someone's going to and then some, you know, some younger mind decides to. You know, it's interesting, too. Part of the controversy around this was a blog post with a um, an excerpt from a book by Megan Rosenblum called Dark Archives, The Librarian's Investigation into the Science and History of Books Bound in Human Skin. And sorry, I've been, I started to say it, but I didn't get to it. Um, the term that made uh, Matt giggle is anthropodermic bibliopagy. Um and uh, there was a post on a, a uh, Harvard blog that referenced this book, Dark Archives, by Megan Rosenblum, um, who is an expert on that very subject, anthropodermic bibliopagy. Rosenblum is is also a part of uh, the Anthropodermic Book Project, which, um, to your point, Ben, you know, there are uh, numerous examples of things that might be this to test the origins and determine if they are, in fact, human skin. Uh, they have confirmed 18 books um, uh, to have been uh, actually bound in human skin. but um, And this drew a lot of negative uh, comment from other folks in the academic community, uh, one of whom was uh, Paul Needham, a retired librarian who had worked at Princeton. Um, and he said the blog post should be deleted uh, because I guess the blog post was just referencing the society and the search for this, these types of books as sort of a value. A, uh, academic pursuit of value uh, and, and and one that, that isn't problematic. And he felt as though uh, by publishing this on their website, they were co-signing it. And Harvard, you know, that kind of co-sign carries a whole heck of a lot of weight. Uh, and he said this, although preservation is a central responsibility of libraries and museums, it is not one isolated from wider questions of ethics. And he wrote this in the New York Review of Books. There are times when the good of preservation must be weighed against other compelling responsibilities. Um, and that original post that he was critiquing has now since been deleted. Uh, and now, of course, this is what's happening with, with the book. Um, they're going to give it some kind of, I imagine it'll be some sort of burial uh, in keeping with what they historically believe might have been the wishes of this individual, which, um, you know, I would think would be a little bit hard to know for sure. But, um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, very, very interesting stuff. One more little quote from uh, Tom Hyrie, a librarian at Harvard, who said this in a, in a news release uh, about getting rid of this from the collection. The core problem with the volume's creation was a doctor who didn't see a whole person in front of him and carried out an odious act of removing a piece of skin from a deceased patient, almost certainly without consent, and used it in a book binding that has been handled by many for more than a century. Um, and I don't know if this is true or not, but the um, Internet Today guys reported on this, and they were joking around, and uh, this is the kind of thing you, you do at a library. You got to, if you're taking a tour, and you're, or maybe you're, you're studying this kind of stuff, people probably got to handle it. I mean, if it's in the collection and you ask, you probably have to put on some gloves, but I bet they pass this thing around. That would make sense. Yeah. So anyway, he just concludes saying, we believe it's time the remains be put to rest. I don't know, Ben, I think you have some really, really great points. And we've talked about this you know, on and off throughout the years about consent uh, when it comes to uh, what happens with our bodies after we die. I mean, there's some people that could care less. We always joke about the Frank Reynolds character on always sunny in Philadelphia saying, just throw me in the trash. You know, there are some people that don't believe the kind of corporeal body matters after you die. But we know also that so many wars have been waged and, and, and so many have died in the name of, you know, the afterlife and the name of religion and what happens to a body uh, after one's death can, can have a lot of impact on what people believe will happen to their soul in the afterlife. So anyway, well done on that. And uh, I don't know, Matt, do you have anything else to add? I think I've, I've kind of said all I have to say on this one. I'm, I, I feel like this is a good thing. I feel like to your point, Matt, um, this is the Harvard take, you're taking the steps to lead by example and maybe get a little bit out of that mindset that you're talking about, Matt. Hopefully it's a move in the right direction. I don't think you should throw anybody's body in the trash. 
if I'm just being honest. And I, I you know, um, yeah, we've talked about this at length, uh, that book in particular. To be clear, none of us, uh, the four of us uh, recording today uh, and you listening along at home, none of us have actually read the book. You know, I, I, I've i never read a book and thought this would be better if a human sacrificed their skin to bind it. I guess that's why it just does it. All the stuff from the doctor that donated this just kind of has the, a little bit of a creepy vibe to it. There's really no I mean, it, as an artifact. It's just kind of a weird, creepy curiosity there. It's, it's not representative of any like ancient culture or anything that is of value. Academically speaking, it's just something a likely very wealthy doctor decided to do with a cadaver he had laying around from grad school, which is just strange in and of itself. And by the way, this was donated, and this kind of tracks, too, for what we're talking about here, uh, by an heir to the Stetson Hat Dynasty. <laughs> just Something about that tickles me, and in, in, in the wrong way. Nobody likes a wrong tickle. No, definitely not. It was this the bad tickle. Now, all, all I'm saying is, I got again, I'm not trying to uh, stereotype, but for some reason I picture – the Stetson hat folks is maybe being of that echelon of, of wealthy types that would maybe get a gas out of trading and, you know, human remains just as a flex. I don't know. Call it a hot take. Let's take a quick break and we'll be back with one more piece of strange news. And we've returned. We're going to split this up into two quick things. Here we go. Number one, the three body problem one of the biggest shows on netflix right now on streamers there's some strange news revolving <laughs> around one of these bodies and there's about think to be, about it there's, revolving there's gonna be a second one very soon three episodes in loving it by the way you guys we talked about it when we were traveling this week and you guys have both binged it and uh, i am really quite enjoying it yeah no spoilers do watch it if you get a chance because it is pretty great Here's the news. We're going to tell you about two individuals. The first one is the victim in this story. His name is Lin Chi. I think that's how you would say his name. L-I-N-Q-I. This person is the founder and chairman of a company called Yuzu Games. That's Y-O-O-Z-O-O. This is a company out of China. They're a game maker, publisher. They do all kinds of stuff. They also control a bunch of intellectual property, including that of the three body problem book series or the the book series that is named that it's been stylized a bit in the u.s with the number three rather than the word three mm -hmm. very elite very elite oh yes he's also known as the quote billionaire millennial this person lin chi was 39 years old and had a net worth of around 941 million dollars u.s at the time mm -hmm. of his death on december 25th 2020 so uh right at on the cusp of being a billionaire but my goodness like this guy had a lot of money uh is very successful the other person we're going to talk about is currently a convicted murderer his name is shu yao that's x-u-y-a-o this person was or at least is described as a quote distinguished attorney at one point He's also the former chief risk officer at that same company, Yuzu Games. Also, Matt, we got to pause real quick. Yeah. Because a lot of folks don't understand CRO, chief risk officer. Oh, yeah. What do we think that is, guys? It's an attorney that's like, how risky is this? <laughs> and, and the attorney says. Yeah, it's not Liam Neeson <laughs> from Take It. Uh, yeah. What's our exposure? But he was a high up person when he first joined the company back right. in 2017. He then moved up in the company by basically moving into a leadership position in a subsidiary uh, that we're going to talk about it. But this is what we know about the story, according to Kelly Ng, who's writing for BBC News. So Lin and Shu were apparently on good terms when they were working together in 2017 Mm -hmm. Um, the subsidiary that she was working for was specifically charged with securing some kind of intellectual property rights deals and film adaptations, moving this, uh, three body problem. Again, we say IP or intellectual property, moving it into other avenues, other mediums, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he's trying to do. He was tasked with doing it. 
Uh, he worked directly and very closely with Lin Shi while trying to broker some kind of deal. And eventually they got in a room with Netflix and uh, they did a really great job. The two men and their respective teams successfully landed an absolutely redonkulous Netflix deal in 2020. The mm -hmm. first season that is out right now that we've been talking about on this show cost around 160 million bucks for Ooh. US US for eight episodes. It got but listen, it got released on March 21st, 2024, and it topped the most watched list on Netflix the following week, the week of March 25th, with 15.6 million views, which is it's massive. It's a new Squid Game. Yes. Yes. That's good, because it's worthy. What's up with this other thing? This other th the three body. There's another version of it that's on another network that I keep seeing. There's a earlier Chinese adaptation. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It just seems like it, it, I was, it was a little bit of brand confusion. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to derail, but I didn't derail. But I was just wondering if they were related. And then I read the description, and it does appear that it's a different version of it. Yeah, it's a different that. version. Uh, fewer deaths. Oh, interesting. I, I don't know anything about that one. I, I mean, fewer offstage deaths. Oh, understood. Okay. So um, the whole thing, I'm, I'm assuming Yuzu Games probably brokered that deal as well, unless they acquired the rights after that series was made, which is possible. I'm just uncertain on that. Uh, but anyway, it's a weird mirror and smoke filled series of rooms when it comes to intellectual property rights and film adaptations and streaming mm. services. It's very weird, especially across uh, international borders. Oh, yeah, exactly. You can have a completely different thing in another country and you could, you know, as someone who is basically licensing a property like this book series, you could get paid, you know, a bunch for however many countries decide to take it up, mm. uh, which is weird. OK, so mm. let's go back to Lin and Shu. They fell out when Lin put some other executives in charge of the business operations that Shu was at one time in charge of. So mm. they basically had a an inter office problem or whatever it yeah. was because a business disagreement for one reason or another, this person that helped land the deal got pushed out. Okay. And Shu, according to some of the reports that came out, some of the trial documents, because this is a part of a huge trial that's been ongoing for quite a while now, since 2021, some of the reports say that Shu set up an entirely new company in Japan to acquire what are quoted here as a lethal substances, red poisons, and then even tested those substances on animals, like funded testing on animals with these substances. Then Shu disguised these substances after he found out they worked as probiotic pills and gave them to his boss, Lin Shi, or I guess his friend, his acquaintance, whoever it was. I don't know what their relationship was towards the end there, but... He gave them to Lynn, and Lynn began taking them, thinking, oh, these are pills my friend gave me. Lynn then checks himself into the hospital because he's feeling super unwell after taking these pills, and he was, you know, not feeling well but initially stable. But then his condition got worse and worse and worse until he eventually died 10 <sighs> days after being admitted to the hospital on Christmas Day 2020 at the age of 39. Insane insane that this occurred it's also insane that this person a shoe was picked up almost immediately because there there were i guess rumors there were things going on and then there was some hard evidence that was discovered quickly went through this huge trial and this is the craziest part to me guys like some kind of weird hmm. the timing of it he was mm -hmm. sentenced to death the day after three body problem hit netflix well, you got to make sure it works first, you know. Yeah. They're done with them. So they might, they might need them for rewrites or something. Why uh, does Netflix never get to season two? Kidding, kidding. Inappropriate. Oh, People I had dead. not heard of any of this. That's so it's you, true. You, it's all true. Poison them over a business disagreement. Everything yeah. Matt's saying is true. But there's like, a depth to it. Yeah, there's depth. There's pre so much premeditation, so many actions that had to have been taken for it to even occur, right? And also that, sloppy, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know. I guess it was sloppy. I mean, I guess. I don't know. I didn't. I haven't actually gone deep into the trial documents to look at what was actually shown. Like, what evidence did they have? But mm. it does feel like one of those things that, I don't know, for a professional squabble, it's, a, it's an insane length to go. And he's now sentenced to death. This is a thing I forgot, y'all. 
several people who also worked in the Yuzu Games offices got sick because there were beverages in one of the shared coolers that were apparently also poisoned. None of them died, but still, how horrifying is that? This person mm. or someone working for this person allegedly also put poisoned drinks in a it's common cooler? Right, because the idea that this... I'm really glad you brought up the coworkers, Matt, because this shows us uh, a little bit more about premeditation in some ways, clearly an unstable actor. Uh, but the, the, from what I understand, the fatal dosage is cumulative, right? So this guy was taking more than one, you know, magic probiotic pill or whatever. Uh, and perhaps the revenge motivation was such that, they rationalize themselves. Anyone can drink this and get a little sick, but let me target this guy's favorite drinks, you know, his cherry Coke zeros or uh, his Fantas or whatever. And then uh, if he drinks enough of these and I can sell them on these probiotics, then I'll get them. Uh, and clearly it's a terrible thing to do. It was a terrible plan. Yeah, it certainly didn't work out for him. Um, so officially, you know, there are now two bodies that will be associated with the three body problem. One that is our one person's there already deceased and one who will be deceased. His time will be up. It just hasn't happened yet. Quick question about the how these types of um, convictions work. Does the legal system typically work pretty quickly in China? Like if you're sentenced to death, are there is there an appeals process? Could this get dragged out the way it does here in the United States? Or is it pretty much like pretty efficient and quick? I have no idea. It depends, to be honest. I mean, it also depends in the U.S. or in Japan. Now, he is currently, uh, the murderer is currently in, uh, incarcerated on the Chinese mainland, correct? Xu Gao is in prison. He has been for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this all goes down a couple of years ago, right? So he's like in his early 40s now. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, thirty. he was also 39 when all of this went down. Right. Okay. Thankfully, I cannot speak with authority on that. Uh, we do know that it appears the case is pretty ironclad. It, it does appear like it does appear that he did it. Right? Yeah, the, tri trial's, he, yeah. the trial's over. He's he was just now sentenced. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense, guys? You, you yeah. Know, oh, yeah. 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 I, I guess that is, you know, we know that even after being sentenced here, a lot of people sit on death row for many, many, mm -hmm. many years. I'm just I'm not, like, not like rooting for him to go and get, get, get killed. But I'm just curious about if it works similarly there, if it's a little bit more, you know, open and shut and that, uh, not, not yeah. any opportunity. It, it strikes me that it might be, but I. I well, that's a great question. Like, uh, how does the appeals process work and does it exist in that nation? Unsure, but guys, let's stay in prison for this next quick story. Uh, no, I, let me I've been trying let to me get out. out of prison so long. Uh, maybe bring it closer to home, Matt. Let's do it. Guys, Operation Skyhawk. Ha -ha. Is that that thing from Batman movie where they put the, they extract him with the That Skyhawk. Ah, dang it. I know. I was just teasing. I like your Hutzpa. Operation Skyhawk. Give me a doc. Give us, some, give us some awesome music right here. Okay. There it is. Yeah. All right. There so is. Operation Skyhawk is an ongoing investigation that started in November 2022, and it culminated on Thursday, March 28th. 2024 while we were uh we were on a little uh work vacay guys hey, um <laughs> not on air not on air man not, not on hey, air but we were we weren't here in georgia i'm just saying when this went down uh that's when search and arrest warrants were served at two locations in the metro atlanta area quote effectively shutting down a sophisticated multi-state criminal enterprise that included civilians inmates mm. and mm. correction staff mm. what was this enterprise doing you may be asking yourself, well, mm -hmm. they were using aerial drones to move cell phones, drugs, and weapons into several Georgia Department of Corrections facilities. And you might also ask yourself, what's the difference between criminals, correction officers, and civilians? Hell of a Venn diagram. I don't, I don't know. I said it. Whatever. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> And guys, there were 150 people arrested, including eight Georgia Department of Corrections employees. There were over a thousand total charges, including mm. contraband introduction, whatever that is, just bringing contraband in, I guess, to a yes. facility. Yeah. 
Contraband Introduction can technically be a book that is not greenlit by the prison system. Oh, snap. What is that? Silent Summer? What was that book? Silent Spring? <laughs> That's the contraband. That's the that everybody probably, uh, there's also yeah. drug trafficking charges and mm. charges for felons in possession of firearms, which is a no-no in the books. So wait, so are they just are, are they droning this into the yard? Oh, snap. Oh, I thought, sorry, I thought you were making a play on droning. Yes, that is what they are doing. Uh, oh, sorry, are they shoegazing this? <laughs> into, yeah. yeah, they're they're using drones. Harsh noising, perhaps. But here's why there are eight corrections facility officers taken in. Why do you think, guys? Oh, I didn't see that drone, or oh, I know exactly where that drone's going. I, that's when I'm on watch in this sector, or whatever. GDC's super underpaid. Yeah. Uh, And it's very difficult to work as a corrections officer, just to be fair. So they probably want to make a little extra money. Oh, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. We don't know all. We don't know everything. This just went down. Uh, There are RICO charges involved, guys. RICO Yes. There are also PCAGA charges. That's participation in criminal gang activity charges associated Mm -hmm. with this. Um, Mm -hmm. And according to the governor's office here in Georgia, this quote may end up being the largest gang related RICO in Georgia's history Uh, so far. Yeah, there's a total street value for all the contraband things that were picked up of seven million dollars, 87 drones, 22 weapons, 273 contraband cell phones and 180 civilian cell phones. Who knows the difference? I don't. We'll find out someday. Also, a crap ton of tobacco, a whole bunch of marijuana, bunch of meth, and ecstasy. Do you have a a sense of how these things were loaded down and, like, uh, distributing these packages? It just seems like a very conspicuous way of delivering these. I didn't see anything in the reporting about what it looked like. I didn't see any pictures of a drone. We We don't have the specifics on the drone uh, models. can Can we conjecture for a minute? Are we to assume that someone on the inside is meeting this thing as it descends and then unpacking it? And then, like, it just seems like it would be so obvious with all of the... The observation towers and things like that to get one of these things over the fence. Probably an airdrop because you don't want to you don't want to risk landing the drone and trying to take it off again. Yeah, because that would get everybody caught, right? Because where yeah, do the drones right. come from? We have an answer, guys, from WSB TV. There is a place called Thunder Drones. It is in Georgia. It's in Norcross. Uh, you can go to their website. It still exists, and. You can see that across the street from Thunder Drones, there is a micro center. You guys familiar with micro center? Yes. It's like computer-y type stuff. Yeah, it's like Like, Radio Shack. Mm -hmm. It's a real good place to procure, I'm going to call them contraband cell phones. Don't blow up the spot. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, it's done. It's blown. Yeah. Uh, according to WSB and Mark Wynn, who was reporting for them, this this company was caught up in, w- in one of the raids, and there were a bunch of drones that were from that facility that were used in this operation. And it is just, a, it's a whole mess that uh, one of the people working there, I think probably the owner operator, I cannot confirm that or not, but it's someone associated with thunder drones named Robert Schwartz, uh, is now like going through it. Um, and he's accused of using his drones to take the contraband in. Uh, there's way more to this story. You can look up a ton on it. It is fascinating stuff, but for now we're going to keep our eyes and ears open. We hope you do too. But as the all powerful yogurt once said, uh, may the Schwartz be with you, Robert, mm, because mm-hmm. you should never underestimate the power of the Schwartz. And mm-hmm. also, I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. Let's see mm-hmm. how well you handle it. Yes. Don't ever cross the Schwartzes. <laughs> yes, but do cross paths with us. Let us know your favorite book bounded human skin. Uh, let us know uh, how you think AI is doing, especially with lavender targeting civilians in the Middle East. Uh, did you know Oregon has o- Oregon has recriminalized drugs? Uh, shout out to Havana syndrome, whatever syndrome you may have. Uh, let us know what you think of Operation Skyhawk, all this and more. And if you have the space balls, fellow conspiracy realist, why not join us for a future episode? Oh, why not join us for listener mail? We would love to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online. That's right. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, and on X. 
FKA Twitter. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and TikTok at the handle Conspiracy Stuff Show. Hey, do you like calling people? Why not give us a call? Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Oh, guys, I totally forgot. Um, I may have gotten us in trouble. I called the number that's listed for Thunder Drones uh, on their website, and sure. there was a message on there. Mm-hmm. That is, I don't want to say was definitely an FBI agent, like we're doing a voicemail message, but I'm sure. pretty sure it was. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, uh, agent Doe, or however you want to go, uh, please contact us for all your micro center needs in the future. <laughs> yeah, just just a heads up. That was us calling for comment. So we're good, right? Yeah. Matt represents us. We are a unified front. <laughs> cool. All right. I think we're good. So when you call that number, give yourself a cool nickname like Helmet or Lone Star, whatever you want to do. Let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. And uh, then you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Just let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. If you got more to say than could fit in that three minute message, why not instead shoot us a good old fashioned email? We are. The folks who read every single email message we get, be careful, be aware. The Void will sometimes write back. Uh, Give us your essays. Give us your haiku, your limericks. Give us your monikers. Give us those ancillary photos, those links. Take us to the edge of the rabbit hole. We will do the rest. We can't wait to hear from you. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.